Um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the hospital presentation. I'm Jessica Levesque. I'm project manager from the rate reform team, um, project lead for hospitals. Um, Michelle? Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, everyone, for joining this morning. My name is Michelle Probert, and I am the director for Main Care, and I will pass it over to Olivia. Hi, everyone. Olivia Alford. I'm the director of delivery system reform within the Main Care office. David? Good morning, everyone. I'm David Jorgensen, director of data analytics and rate setting for, for Main Care. I will pass it over to Stephen. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Stephen Hobley. I'm a principal with Burns & Associates, a division of health management associates. We are supporting the Office of Main Care in the rate reform um, project. Jessica, thank you. Jessica? Thank you. Okay, we will start the presentation. Julie? Okay. Next slide. I want to remind everyone that today's uh, presentation is being recorded, as I stated, and we will be sending a link for that and this PowerPoint presentation that will be saved on the rate reform website. We will post the website in the chat during this presentation. Um, so you can keep checking it. It'll be posted later today or tomorrow. Um, today's agenda, will we will be going over the rate determination process, fiscal year 2025 hospital reform budget summary, which includes hospital taxes, inpatient services, which will be facility reimbursement of outlier adjustments, days awaiting placement, readmission adjustments, and COLAs, cost of living adjustment. For outpatient services facility reimbursement, we will be talking about payment to provider-based departments, professional reimbursement, and then at the end, we'll talk about next steps. Next slide, please. This is part of our rate determination process for rate reform. So we do have a new law, 22 MRS subscript 3173J, which is a standalone section of main law enacted in August of 2022, codifying processes and principles for the main care rate reform system. So we used to refer to this as chapter 639, where now it's it, there were some changes to this. So now this is what it's called. So this uh, rate reform process sets a schedule for a regular rate review and adjustments, annual updates to rates that are benchmarked off of Medicare and other payers. For non-benchmarked rates, the department annually develops a schedule of rate determination for the upcoming year. Rates not being redetermined per the schedule receive annual cost of living adjustments. This process also ensures a review of relevant state and national data to inform rate amounts and payment models, formalizes clear and transparent processes of our rate determination, establishes a rate system subcommittee of the MAC, which is the main care advisory committee. The technical advisory panel advises on related technical matters as appropriate and reviews annual schedules for the rate determination. Next slide. This is our specific rate determination process for this hospital, acute rehab and critical access hospitals. So we did hold a public forum in December 11, 2023, which focuses, focused on inpatient. February 26, 2024, we held another forum which focused on outpatient and critical access hospitals. Today, we will be talking about additional detail on inpatient and outpatient, and it includes a, the draft rate to the base amounts and percent benchmark to Medicare. After this meeting from today through June 25th, there will be an official written comment period where we'll be accepting comments from you about the rate determination process and the draft rates. Then we will do a review of the comments and do draft response, do responses, and those will once we are approved, they will be posted on our rate reform website. Next slide. Uh, 
I'm going to turn this over to Michelle. Great. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks, everyone, again, for joining us this morning. Uh, I hope it's not an exaggeration or an overstatement when I say that this uh, feels like a momentous presentation. Um, the uh, We have said for a few years now that we acknowledge that uh, reimbursement reform for hospitals has been uh, long overdue. Uh, it is currently very outdated. Um, also, uh, the complexity of hospital reimbursement and the scope um, uh, is broad, uh, and I appreciate everyone's patience. We know that um, we have delayed this third forum that we're holding on hospital reform a couple of times. Um, uh, it uh, uh, was really due to this complexity of scope and, uh, and uh, not ideal, we recognize. So thank you for your patience um, as we've worked through all the details to get to today's presentation, which will be the first presentation where um, we are uh, sharing specific uh, draft numbers in, in relation to the aspects of this model. I wanted to take a moment before we delve into the details uh, to talk about the achievements of this proposed model um, at a high level. Uh, I will acknowledge that there are also challenges um, and uh, and that some providers face those challenges more than others. And so I don't, um, I, I, I very much want to acknowledge that, but also want to talk about um, the reasons why uh, we are excited about moving forward. Um, first, uh, this proposal invests a historic 119 million in reimbursement for hospitals. Um, in our main care, rate reform process. We don't often uh, talk about uh, budget amounts um, when it comes to hospital reimbursement, and, and we focus on costs uh, when it comes to hospital reimbursement, um, similar to some other services within main care, like nursing facilities, for example. It's a little bit different of a circumstance because we are bound by upper payment limits that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services sets in terms of what we can reimburse. Um, and so we uh, uh, we knew that we couldn't we can't go over UPL without paying money back. Um, uh, and so in this effort, we are really trying to uh, have inputs into our model and base rates and percentages uh, that will invest, but will not go over that UPL. And um, uh, I will say that uh, our initial proposal that we were discussing, uh, you need to build in a margin of error for that UPL. Uh, that margin of error over the course of uh, the budget session has gotten smaller, um, uh, but uh, we are hopeful that we're still within that UPL and, and the reinvestment numbers that you see reflect that. I also want to note that I already said that the current model is very outdated. Uh, going forward, we will be updating inpatient base rates as well as the weights for diagnosis-related groups um, uh, on an annual basis, uh, as well as bringing those base rates and DRG weights um, up to, to current day so that they're better reflective of uh, the patient acuity uh, that hospitals see and the costs that are associated with that patient acuity. Um, I will also note that there are changes in this presentation that in isolation uh, may result in decreased reimbursement to some hospitals. Um, in those instances, uh, we are recognizing um, the potential decrease there and therefore um, offsetting those decreases through reinvestment so that uh, we are still hitting the target 119 million in investment in the model uh, overall. So an easier way of saying that is that something goes down, something else goes up. Uh, I already noted um, that a positive change going forward for stability is annual cost of living adjustments uh, in addition to our current practice of updating percentage of uh, Medicare rates um, or updating the Medicare rates that we benchmark on an annual basis for outpatient. Um, I will also note that uh, as it's been um, an objective for the department across rate reform efforts, we are looking to reduce administrative burden. Um, uh, and uh, this applies to the department as well as certain providers uh, where we're moving away from cost settlement. 
uh, and also eliminating the critical access hospital tax. Um, I acknowledge that there are absolutely other aspects of those proposals that um, that are big transitions and difficult. So um, I, I don't uh, want to discount that, but acknowledge that there are some um, benefits to those moves. Uh, and then I also uh, want to note that uh, this, this proposal today uh, focuses on value. And uh, we have been consistent from the outset of our evaluation of main care's rate system um, as well as specific to this project that we really are looking to improve our alignment with Medicare and making strides in enhancing that relationship between quality outcomes and payment. I'll just um, say up front that uh, this, this presentation includes some proposals where in the past we've told you we were going to talk more about it and we are today. It also includes some proposals that we have uh, not discussed explicitly uh, that are in alignment with the objectives that I have shared here. I will just say that um, it has been uh, a difficult balance. I'm not going to pretend we always get it right um, in the process over uh, uh, this past session to come to agreement on a general approach to hospital reform through a collaborative effort, which we've very much appreciated, but also wanting to make sure that we respect the main care rate reform process um, and uh, and that statute, uh, which allows for transparent public discourse, um, and and then it's it's been a challenge uh, given again the scope and complexity of hospital reimbursement. Um, uh, but it has been our objective to have that balance. All right, uh, next slide. So this is a very high level view of. Um, the budget uh, that is um, that came out as PL 2023 Chapter 643. Uh, you can see that there was 90.3 million for hospital reimbursement reform, and then there was additional hospital um, reimbursement funding of almost 29 million for uh, a slightly less than 119 million total, as indicated on the previous slide. Next slide. Uh, I very much want to acknowledge that this uh, this investment in hospital reimbursement um, uh, is in part due to significant contribution from hospitals uh, through an increased tax amount to acute care hospitals uh, uh, that will go into effect in January. And so that has been a, a critical piece of this effort. I also wanted to call out that part JJ of the supplemental budget that passed um, does indicate that revenue from this hospital tax must be reinvested in main care's payments to in-state hospitals. And so this proposal um, uh, reflects that connection. All right, uh, so I am going to now transition into some uh, into the detail of the different pieces of hospital reimbursement reform that we are addressing. So I will start out on the inpatient side um, with one small, I will say fairly technical uh, exception. Today's presentation is uh, really on the facility um, reimbursement side of the equation and, and not the professional side of the equation. Um, I will say that I, you'll see some commonality in these slides. I, I'm not going to go through all the detail of the current methodology and the draft methodology. Um, uh, a lot of that is repeat from the forums that we held in December and February. So I'm really going to focus um, my comments on the key changes that, um, that you'll see in those proposals. Uh, we, where applicable, will talk about uh, um, new recommendations um, or more fleshed out recommendations in some circumstances that we're uh, putting forward uh, today. And then we'll show you how those uh, numbers um, uh, have calculated out in order to hit that $119 million investment, as well as stay within the bounds of the UPL, both for inpatient and outpatient and different facility types as applicable. All right, so acute inpatient facility methodology. Um, 
Uh, first, I will note that uh, we, again, are transitioning from um, base rates that were over a decade old um, to a base rate that are now uh, updated uh, as well as standardized. Um, we, uh, while before the base rates were hospital specific, now we have a standard base rate um, uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, for private hospitals, so, so non-municipality um, owned. Um, for teaching hospitals, uh, there is an add-on uh, for GME related costs. Um, and so that, that is a big change. Uh, another change is that um, unlike the current methodology, the rates for, um, or the rates cover uh, capital costs and GME prospectively, and those are not subject to cost settlement um, going forward. Uh, the GME add-on is hospital specific, recognizing that, um, uh, you know, teaching models in different hospitals can look quite different. So we felt that in that case, it, it was uh, appropriate to uh, determine that add-on amount um, for each teaching hospital. Uh, also, again, um, uh, instead of having a, a DRG system um, that was set over a decade ago and not touched, uh, we are updating or we're benchmarking the relative weights for DRG to Medicare and we'll update those annually. Um, we have discussed that in a, a future um, a redetermination five years from now, we are open to whether it makes sense to have main care specific relative weights uh, again, but uh, made the decision to, uh, for now to be consistent with Medicare. Um, Again, the base rates as well as the GME add-on will be updated annually for inflation. And this methodology uh, is now going to apply to all acute care hospitals. Uh, so um, in summary, we take that base rate, um, uh, which varies by public or private hospital. Uh, for teaching hospitals, there is then a GME add-on rate. Um, and then we take the sum of those together and multiply it by the DRG weight in order to come up with the reimbursement. Okay, next slide. All right, uh, so this is the proposed methodology for rehab hospitals of which we currently have one in the state of Maine. Uh, currently, there is a flat discharge rate um, um, as our reimbursement methodology and we are uh, folding the rehab hospital into our DRG methodology that we have uh, for the acute care hospitals. Uh, this will better account for patient acuity to uh, align reimbursement, uh, improve the alignment of reimbursement um, with those patient needs and related costs and services. Uh, the DRG weights, just like with the acute care, uh, will be benchmarked annually to Medicare, um, and also consistent with the methodology for acute, acute care, uh, the capital costs are uh, built in to this rate and are not subject to cost settlement. Um, I'll also note that, that, that the current flat discharge rate uh, was last updated in 2018. So uh, that uh, has been a while and is due for updates as well. Okay, another component of um, uh, inpatient facility reimbursement, which we have discussed previously, is uh, approach to um, uh, episodes of care that uh, inpatient stays that, that are really outliers in terms of cost. So next slide. So uh, consistent with our presentation, I think it was from back in December, uh, currently, we determine outlier status um, based on a threshold that is connected to hospital charges. As we shared previously, we want to change to a threshold that is based on costs. Uh, we are also, um, currently, we reimburse at 80% of estimated costs over that threshold, uh, and this proposal moves to 90% uh, of cost coverage uh, over the threshold instead. Um, uh, this remains our plan. Um, uh, however, 
Uh, this has been a complicated update for our claim system. Um, and because of that, we're going to have to take a two-phased uh, approach to getting to the ultimate goal of having that uh, cost-based threshold. Um, so our phase one uh, is that we're going to um, update that threshold amount um, and move to the uh, increased percentage of reimbursement beyond the threshold. So you can see in the box in the lower left there, um, and then phase two, which will be for uh, January of 2025, is when we will be able to uh, change to that cost-based threshold amount instead. Um, our threshold amounts here are, um, and uh, remember that phase one is still a charge-based threshold, phase two is a cost-based threshold, and that is why uh, those numbers um, look pretty different, uh, but that difference is consistent with what we see for average uh, cost to charge ratios. So the uh, phase one threshold will be $150,000, which is based on charges, and the phase two would be $50,000 based on costs. And the threshold amount would get updated annually for inflation as well. Uh, I also want to call out here that unlike current day, uh, rehabilitation hospital will also be eligible for outlier payments, um, uh, which they are not currently. Uh, and then lastly, uh, in order to inform that $50,000 cost threshold amount, uh, I'll just note that that applies to about 10% of claims right now based on our analysis, which we found uh, it was pretty appropriate when you're thinking about true outlier status. You don't generally want to have a methodology that applies to more than 10% uh, of the claims that you are looking at. Okay, so we've also mentioned so, in the Michelle, past. Michelle, sorry, did you, did you want to take questions during it? There's a hand raised. Or do you want to wait till the end? Uh, I will look to uh, what is our standard practice, Jessica? Or do you have a preference? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to say that at the beginning. We've saved a time at the end for questions and comments pertaining to the presentation. So we will. Um, I will explain to everyone how we're going to do that at the end. Sorry about that. No problem. And I often like informally taking questions and answers during the presentation, but I also recognize we have a lot of content to get through. And so we want to make sure that uh, we are able to, to do that. Um, okay, so uh, days of waiting placement. This is a topic that we flagged in the past that we were going to uh, discuss more. Uh, the days of waiting placement reimbursement um, uh, policy uh, was repealed by law effective last December 31st, so it is not currently in place. Uh, our proposal is to re reintroduce the days awaiting placement reimbursement. Uh, we are proposing to double what had been the cap, so going from 500,000 to uh, a million. Um, we uh, decided that uh, uh, to be fiscally conservative, we still want to have a cap. Um, and this is uh, in part because this is an area where we really have a lack of data in terms of uh, current frequency of individuals who um, uh, are unfortunately needing to stay in hospitals for longer than, than we would all prefer um, and what that impact is. And so with a significant increase to the cap, uh, that will enable us to have better data. Uh, we are also, we've also had a lot of conversations around um, expanding uh, the criteria for, for members on whose basis we can pay the days of waiting placement. Um, and I know that that's been uh, an interest from the hospitals uh, as well. Um, to start, we are expanding to PNMI E. Um, uh, those are our. Um, private non-medical institutions for uh, adults with serious mental illness. Uh, we've had conversations with the Office of Behavioral Health as well as Maine Care's Complex Case Unit. And our understanding is that um, uh, in addition to nursing facility eligible residents, uh, uh, patients who are looking for PNMIE placement um, are, are, are often uh, where hospitals are, are having the hardest time. Um, as we uh, have 
talked about, um, as noted in previous legislation, looking at PNMICs um, as well. Uh, we are open to that for the future. I will say that right now, um, uh, expanding eligibility in general has implications in terms of our eligibility assessment processes with the department, um, as well as technical systems integration to recognize uh, eligibility assessments and claims. And so um, it is quite complicated and time intensive. So as step one, we are proposing to expand to PNMIE and uh, need to look at January 1 to do that, again, because of um, the interactions between the eligibility processes and the systems. Uh, but this is another area where um, uh, we will be able to collect better data to inform uh, what we want um, a potentially broader policy to look like in the future. Uh, let's see. So um, other key changes um, compared to the historic practice here, uh, we are looking to eliminate the uh, what had been a 10 day waiting period. Um, uh, we anticipate that that will be welcomed by hospitals. And on our side, that also helps us um, take what has been more of a manual process and automate it. Um, which will uh, be an improvement uh, for hospitals in terms of speed of reimbursement as well as uh, within the department. Um, and I will also note that uh, the last time that we had uh, the days of waiting placement uh, policy in place, um, it was the interpretation uh, that we needed to uh, include out-of-state hospitals in this because the previous legislation did not state otherwise. And um, in this proposal, we are recommending that we reserve this policy for in-state hospitals. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is stated in the middle box, but probably I should have added it to the box on the right as well. Um, we are proposing to go to 75% of the uh, statewide average nursing facility per diem rate. Uh, we, are, we are proposing um, as draft a percentage of the per diem rate. This, this is consistent with what we see from other states um, and really recognizes the fact that due to the setting constraints associated with a hospital, uh, it's, it's not the same level of care uh, that these um, uh, members are receiving compared to if they were in their appropriate placement. And so we feel that that percentage of reimbursement um, is, is appropriate. Uh, lastly, just um, uh, to clarify the days waiting placement reimbursement for critical access hospitals um, is addressed separately in hospital policy um, and is, is not changing under this proposal. Okay, I am going to take a break from speaking and uh, pass it off to Olivia Alford, who is going to talk about our proposal for uh, readmissions reimbursement. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so today we're going to propose how we look to change our readmissions policy or readmissions penalty that um, hasn't been touched in a number of years. And you've heard from us in the past the ways that we're looking to evaluate the policy around what readmissions were counted, which hospitals were included, what subunits were included, how could we align with Medicare, um, and how could we make sure that we are um, being thoughtful in how this um, is rolled out. So currently, uh, main care readmission policy or readmission penalty is quite limited. We look at a 14-day window for a member to be readmitted to the same hospital with the exact same DRG uh, for the readmission. Um, there are a number of exclusions in policy. Um, subunits are excluded. Patients receiving um, inpatient chemotherapy are ex excluded, and there are a number of behavioral health exclusions that are broader than the subunits themselves, such as when a person um, has uh, is, is at the, a level of care for medically supervised withdrawal for their substance use, or um, they have a mental health diagnosis, which essentially is, means they're in for a mental health um, DRG-based service. Um, there are also a number of exclusions that are not stated in our policy. So one of the goals you'll hear about today is to just make sure that our readmission policy is transparent so everyone knows what is and isn't subject to this penalty 
Um, and that's been a way that we've really been able to uh, look at the data and say, okay, we want to make it this a little bit more meaningful as far as driving value, but we also want to make sure that we, that we are all clear that there are going to be a number of exceptions to this policy going forward. So um, uh, we will can go to the next slide and I'll kind of talk through what we are proposing. Um, we are proposing to extend the window from the 14 day period to a, a standard 30 day readmissions window that is commonplace in almost every other um, payer or measure situation. The biggest change we'll talk about here too is we're, we're looking to change to clinically related standards to assess the penalty. So again, I mentioned before, and I'll talk a little bit on the next slide, right now is a very limited uh, look to see whether the second admission was related to the first. We'd like to have that be the more standard uh, best practice of was it a clinically related readmission? And if so, there will be no payment for that second readmission within the 30 days. We are looking to discontinue the broad behavioral health exclusions um, because we do believe that there should be accountability for the transitions of care and follow-up related to behavioral health conditions um, when they are being treated in, in the hospital setting. However, we will propose to continue to exclude the, re the psych and SUD subunits from the readmission policy in, in support of having those um, subunits operating. Another thing that came through in the review of the data that the team did is that with the change, the changes just discussed, it's it's actually very meaningful to add an exclusion around obstetric and newborn related readmissions because you see a lot of that uh, and, and that's really a different um, situation that we don't think should fall into this category of, of this uh, this policy. And that's aligned with how other states operate as well. So on the right-hand side, you'll see that the policy has, the proposed policy, will have a number of exclusions. Some of these you may not be aware are current policy. Um, you know, we, again, we'll continue to exclude psych SUD rehab subunits, the chemotherapy, the obstetric, the newborn I just mentioned, linked admissions, self-directed discharges. That's been a point of lack of clarity in the past. We already don't penalize for self-directed discharges. We will continue to do that in the future and you'll see a number of other um, kind of technical exclusions, including the fact that we will not hold rehab hospitals or non-DRG hospitals uh, or out-of-state hospitals to this penalty. Um, next slide, I just wanna talk a little bit about the um, process and interpretation of the, of the data that led to this recommendation. So we reviewed significant amounts of readmission data from, from from the hospitals um, for all causes. And we also looked at historical readmission penalty information for a subset of hospitals or a sample to look at what we think the financial impact would be to moving to this broader policy that's more aligned with the, the best practice um, in this area. And you'll see that on the next slide that we, we are anticipating this would be a $2 million um, result, in, increase in penalty. So a reduction of $2 million for hospitals but as Michelle stated, that's gonna be reinvested, that is being reinvested in the DRG base rates for paying for the services that we wanna see while, while keeping the incentive there to reduce the kind of services we don't wanna see. The most meaningful in, uh, expansion of this policy is in changing to a clinically related standard. Um, just to even just really um, drive home the point, in the current policy, the person could be readmitted from a DRG without complications to one with, and we wouldn't have penalized for that. So obviously with a DRG series, that's very limited and also doesn't capture things like post-operative complications, which are with their own DRG. So really an important distinction to move to clinically related. Um, with the exclusions that we're adding for obstetric newborn, that is far more meaningful than the, uh, as far as number of admissions excluded then our inclusion of a few additional behavioral health related readmissions. So the balance, uh, we're trying to maintain that balance there. Um, and then just as an interesting fact, um, a, a greater portion of readmissions happen within the first 14 days in the latter two weeks. Um, but of course, moving to a 30 day window does increase the number of, of readmissions that would be caught here. And I think I'm handing it either to Michelle or David. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. Um, 
So uh, now is where we get into the numbers. Um, and uh, as a reminder, um, when Michelle presented this overview, we are creating four peer groups for our DRG reimbursement. Um, critical access hospitals won't be getting the DRG reimbursement, so they're, they're not listed here, but the four peer groups will be the, the teaching and non-teaching uh, acute care hospitals, uh, the NSGO hospital, we have one in Maine that uh, we've referred to it elsewhere in the presentation as a public hospital or municipally owned hospital, uh, and then the inpatient rehabilitation hospital. Um, so these um, peer groups were created um, to reflect the, the difference in uh, acuity, uh, for example, of, of the uh, facility types, uh, but also because there are um, some different UPL uh, requirements that we need to meet for the NSGO hospital um, compared to the, uh, the, the private hospitals. Um, with that said, uh, to get into the numbers, uh, these gray boxes on the left uh, kind of represent what, uh, what the proposal would be if the only changes we were making were uh, rebasing the DRGs and, and moving to the Medicare DRG weights, uh, along with updating the, the uh, outlier methodology. Um, the blue boxes on the right represent the additional policy changes of uh, expanding the readmissions penalty, uh, but also adding in that days awaiting placement reimbursement uh, with the additional, the hundred mil, sorry, the one million dollar annual cap. Um, so you can see uh, that one million dollars for the days awaiting placement represents a, a portion of that two million dollars uh, of reinvestment that we need to do to meet that um, expanded readmissions policy. Uh, but we also have increased the DRG base rates. Uh, for the hospitals that will be subject to that uh, readmission uh, penalty expansion. So uh, the rehab hospital is not subject to that. So their, their base rate doesn't increase there, but um, the, uh, the, the base rates do increase for the teaching, non-teaching and NSGO peer groups. And, uh, and then just to get into a little bit more specifics about our annual adjustments, um, we, uh, we really wanna make sure um, that we have some mechanism to uh, keep the, the rates um, keeping pace approximately with, uh, with cost increases on an annual basis in between rebasings so that uh, rates reimbursement isn't stagnant for uh, a decade before um, we get to another rebasing. Um, so uh, we are building in this uh, on the inpatient side, we'll be increasing the DRG base rates, uh, including the GME and, and capital uh, assumptions there, um, along with the outlier thresholds um, by the percent increase uh, associated with the, the IHS market uh, healthcare cost review uh, economic trend factor. Uh, that index has been used in our policy um, for, for a while. Uh, we're using the same index for the distinct psych and SUD reimbursement um, that, that those units will be getting their first COLA on July 1st. So uh, we've chosen this index to align with, with that practice. Um, this is slightly different from what Medicare does. Uh, Medicare has uh, different indexes for uh, capital, for example, um, but we chose to keep it a little bit uh, simpler, more straightforward, and uh, just apply a single index. Um, and then in addition to uh, those Colas, uh, we're, we're also going to be uh, using the updated uh, DRG relative weights that CMS uh, publishes on an annual basis. Uh, 
All right, uh, so moving over to the outpatient side, um, our current methodology, um, uh, under our current methodology, we are paying 83.7% of Medicare's APCs um, for, uh, for most of our uh, acute care hospitals. Um, for the public NSGO hospital, um, that is currently paid through a, a prospective interim payment and cost settlement on the outpatient side at 83.8% of costs. Um, and, uh, and the, that 83.7% of Medicare uh, applies equally on the outpatient outliers uh, as well. Um, we do reimburse, um, outside of APCs, uh, based on main care fee schedules. Um, so I guess first I'll, I'll say under our proposed methodology that, um, those payments outside of APCs will continue uh, forward being paid off of those respective fee schedules uh, if they're not reimbursed through the APC. Um, so with the proposed methodology, we are looking at um, for both the private and the NSGO hospital moving to an increased percent of the Medicare APCs. Um, that, that increased percent will also apply to the outlier adjustments. Uh, and this uh, allows us to uh, better align that, that methodology uh, across the hospital types. Um, and we'll get into the numbers in a future slide, but we are uh, increasing that percentage uh, in order to, to maximize reimbursement under the UPL. Uh, so one, New um, feature of our uh, outpatient methodology that we are, oh, sorry, I should be passing this slide over to Michelle. Uh, sorry, Michelle. No problem, David. Um, okay, so uh, we one new proposal that's featured in this presentation is uh, to better align um, or align with Medicare as well as with commercial payers uh, more so in terms of our treatment of uh, off-campus provider-based departments. Um, I'll just note that on an earlier slide in my introduction, I noted um, the importance of alignment with Medicare um, as we've taken on rate reform projects, um, including this hospital rate reform endeavor. Uh, we have also consistently stated that uh, we really want to be consistent in our approach to reimbursement across providers that deliver the same services. And so this, uh, this draft proposal is consistent with those objectives um, that we've been emphasizing over the past number of years. Uh, I'll say that over this past year, um, there's been increased awareness within the department um, about the degree to which main care is not just misaligned with Medicare in this regard, but also with commercial payers in the state. Um, we recognize that this is a more significant change. Um, uh, and so we wanted to uh, really use this public rate reform process to delve into the details um, rather than, for example, having an external committee uh, uh, kind of weigh in on what we should do um, in this regard. Um, but uh, as I've also noted, uh, it, it, due to complexity and scope, um, I will acknowledge that we're having the conversation uh, a bit later than we would all prefer. Um, so um, as uh, folks are likely aware, uh, CMS developed modifiers um, in the context of Medicare to pay hospital provider-based departments uh, more in line with independent physician practices, uh, a, a more site-neutral payment policy uh, that doesn't reimburse those hospital-based practices, provider-based departments for hospital facility costs. We had been uh, more aligned with Medicare, but I think it was around 2015 that we kind of split off from Medicare and we continued to allow exemptions uh, based on setting that Medicare moved away from. Um, so as a result, most of our provider-based departments in Maine continue to be grandfathered, if I can use that 
word um, and are not required to apply a CMS modifier to reduce payment. They receive full APC reimbursement as if the services were provided within the main hospital facility. Um, so next slide. So you can see that um, currently uh, Medicare requires use of a PO modifier, which does um, reduce reimbursement for dedicated emergency departments, uh, remote locations of a hospital that are within 200 and, oh, sorry, I always mess up on this one, remote locations of an inpatient hospital and locations that are within 250 yards of a remote location um, uh, and locations billing as outpatient prior to November, 2015. So. Um, we uh, have not required um, settings that meet uh, these criteria to apply the PO modifier that Medicare uh, is now requiring them to apply that results uh, in reduced payment. And with this um, proposal, we are uh, proposing to align, um, align with Medicare. Uh, this one other point that I wanted to make, but it's not coming to mind right now. Um, oh, I, I remember. So um, as I, I had noted at the outset, and I think David just referred to again as well, um, uh, we feel that this is the right opportunity to move forward with this change because we do have the opportunity of reinvestment in the system. And so while we recognize that in isolation, this would result in reductions to hospital reimbursement, we are able to offset those uh, reductions through reinvestment into the model. So we will still achieve our objective of improved alignment with Medicare and with commercial payers, as well as more equitable treatment across providers, um, but still uh, hit that $119 million in investment. Okay, I will turn back to David uh, to talk about our calculation of the fiscal impact of this proposed change. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, so to uh, identify the dollar amount that, that we would need to reinvest in those outpatient services, um, we uh, took an approach of, of uh, estimating the percent of claims or the, the percent of outpatient reimbursement that uh, what we would expect to see this PO modifier associated with um, when we add this requirement. Uh, our, our way of estimating that was to look at Medicare crossover claims that, that we receive uh, for members who are duly enrolled uh, under both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and since Medicare does require that, that PO modifier, um, we uh, use that, the, the assumption that um, the same percent of claims that, uh, or the same percent of uh, payments that Medicare makes would, would also apply to uh, an equivalent percent on the main care side. Uh, with that said, um, about 6% uh, of the Medicare crossover claims um, had, were associated with that, that PO modifier. So we've estimated that 6% uh, of our modeled reimbursement without the PO modifier uh, would um, require that PO modifier and then be reimbursed at the 40% of the equivalent on-campus rate. Uh, so that 40% of the 6% uh, came to uh, approximately $10 million, and uh, that $10 million will be reinvested uh, in, in that um, percent of Medicare APC that, that we'll be reimbursing. So to get into uh, those numbers here, um, if we, uh, again, look at the, the gray box uh, without that uh, expanded, um, uh, the PO modifier requirements, um, we would uh, estimate that we, we could max out the UPL uh, at about 107% of Medicare. 
Um, with the, the PO modifier requirement, uh, we can increase the percent of Medicare uh, up to 109%. Um, we'll just mention with, um, with the public NSGO hospital, um, we, we also estimate that uh, this will cover a, a greater percent of cost, even though it won't be uh, cost settled anymore. Um, this will also be an increase uh, both on the private and, and rehabilitation side, as well as the public NSGO side. David, um, sorry, uh, if we could go back to that previous slide, I just uh, wanted to call out a couple more things here. Um, so uh, I, I will note, you'll see a little asterisk next to the 107% in the in the middle column there. Um, and I just wanted to note that when we uh, were sharing some estimates last fall, um, we were looking at a slightly higher percent there. And this is always the the problem with uh, sharing numbers is that numbers change. And, and after we had run those estimates in the fall, uh, there were a number of changes. Um, uh, one is that uh, our initial estimates had used 2023 APCs. Um, we are now updating those to 2024 APCs, which result resulted in increases. Um, second, David noted that uh, we are continuing um, uh, to reimburse as we have for um, services paid outside of APCs. Um, our initial modeling um, uh, uh, assumed zero reimbursement, um, and, and that wasn't uh, something that we were fully aware of uh, until after the fact. So that also resulted in increased reimbursement. Um, and again, because we are uh, uh, doing this dance where we still have to hit a target and stay under UPL if we're reimbursing more in certain components, then we need to adjust that percentage uh, so that we still stay under the UPL. Um, and so those are uh, a couple examples of um, uh, increased reimbursement to the model that resulted in a decrease uh, to that uh, percentage of, of Medicare. Hopefully that makes sense. But um, uh, we are pleased that we are still looking at an extremely significant increase to that percent of uh, Medicare with this proposal, uh, again, going from slightly under 84% um, to 109%. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, for, for this slide, I uh, wanted to touch briefly on our uh, outpatient professional reimbursement uh, and cost settlement process. Um, we, uh, we did not set out to change anything on the, the professional side with our hospital reform process, um, but because of uh, some other changes where um, we have one uh, acute care hospital that uh, has been reimbursed under uh, per perspective interim payments and, and cost settled. Uh, the, the switch for that hospital to move to DRGs and APCs and uh, fee schedule based payments um, for, uh, for their reimbursement has, um, we, we didn't want to additionally change their professional uh, uh, cost settlement at the same time. Um, so in order to keep that uh, reimbursement the same, uh, we are adding um, for, for that hospital that had received the prospective interim payments and was reimbursed uh, along the same policy as a critical access hospital, um, where we're going to make sure they meet the definition of a rural hospital um, so that they will continue to be reimbursed at 100% of cost for those professional services. All right, and uh, so critical access hospitals uh, have not really been uh, talked about yet in this presentation. So, um, with the um, with the elimination of the critical access hospital tax, 
um, we are proposing a, a reduction in the percent of costs that they'll be uh, receiving at that time of settlement. Um, this, this percent of costs that we've selected still results in uh, the, the reduction in reimbursement is smaller than the reduction in, in the tax obligation. So uh, we are, um, we're confident that um, critical access hospitals will be uh, better off as a, a result of uh, these changes on, on both the tax side and, uh, and the reimbursement side combined. Sorry, just before you um, uh, delve into next steps, I did want to uh, call out because I, I don't know that we called this out on all of the preceding slides. Um, but uh, as a result of how um, uh, the budget passed um, and that uh, the effective date of the supplemental budget isn't until August 9th. Uh, that has an impact on where we will be able to make changes retroactively versus where some changes will need to be prospectively, uh, perspective. And uh, the, the basic rule is that um, if, where there are changes that are neutral or we um, uh, project that they will be beneficial changes to all providers, um, then we will have those changes uh, effective retroactive to July 1. Um, where there are changes uh, that um, in isolation may have a negative impact on uh, certain providers, uh, those changes would just be prospective from the effective date um, of the budget, which we anticipate will be uh, August 9th. Um, and then again, because of certain, um, because of systems challenges uh, for a couple provisions, um, we have January 1, uh, and, and I'll let uh, Eska go back to the to the details. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so here we are. Next steps in timeline. As Michelle stated, um, there will be varying um, implementation dates depending on the item. Today we're having our final public forum. Uh, June twenty fifth is the date you're going to want to get your comments into the rate reform email. Um, if you have any questions, though, my email will be supplied also on this um, slide presentation that you will get sent a link to, and it will be posted on our web rate reform website. Um, July 1st will be retroactive changes to the current methodology that are neutral or will benefit the providers. It will include the proposed methodologies for acute and rehab hospitals and also phase one of the inpatient outlier methodology, DAP for um, NFs. On August 9th will be the changes for the methodology in isolation may have a negative impact on the providers. This includes readmissions and the provider-based department reimbursement adjustments. And then as Michelle had explained earlier in the presentation, there will be phase two for the methodology for critical access hospitals of the inpatient outlier methodology, DAP and PNM, PNMIEs. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So here we've got to the part where everybody wants to be. So questions, I'm gonna just take a quick minute to go over um, how we're gonna do this. So raise your hand with the function um, at the bottom of your screen. Try to keep your questions. We have a remaining half an hour to three minutes so everyone has a chance. Um, people on the internet um, select reactions or participants meeting from the controls at the bottom of your screen and then select raise hand or press Alt-Y on your computer's keyboard to toggle to raise hand on or off. Telephone users, please press star nine um, on your phone. Um, the official comment period, we've listed the email address below where you will send your comments. So we will ask people at this time, if you would raise your hand and we'll call on you in the order that you raised your hand um, for questions. So. If folks can also um, introduce themselves and say where they are from, um, that would be great. Okay. Jeff? 
Hi, good afternoon. Jeff Austin with the Maine Hospital Association. A couple of comments and then uh, I think one question. Uh, first, it is a bit frustrating to us to see this facility fee change so late in the process. The conversations between the department and MHA began in December of 22. And all through this period, including through the legislative review process, this was not on the table. So we have not seen it. We do not understand the impact to our members. And so this late in the game, I think we have to go on the record and just say it's it's too much too late. Obviously, we're open to conversations with the department uh, on the issue. It's an outstanding issue that lots of people talk about. But to see a fully developed proposal for the first time now is really difficult this late in the game. Um, second comment would be, I think a two week comment period is way too short, uh, especially given the newness of this facility fee proposal. So confining us to, to a two week period to try to get a handle on what the impacts of all these changes are is a little difficult. I think it's very difficult, and I think the comment period should be extended. Um, I have a bunch of different questions, uh, but trying not to hog the microphone. The one big one that jumps out to me, I'm still unclear, and it may be just me, but for purposes of the outpatient facility fee, are you aligning to Medicare's current policy, including grandfathered facilities as of whatever the date is, 2015, where they, they continue to pay the facility fee for what we call grandfathered facilities as of 2015, I believe. Or are you getting, or are you getting rid of facility fees for all off-campus Medicaid payments? I'm still unclear. So um, thank you. Thanks, Jeff, for those comments. Um, our intent uh, is to align with current Medicare policy. to yep hi yes um kind of the same direction on the outlier um calculation uh medicare for outlier purposes i believe combines the the two um uh the readmission sorry i'm, I'm going off topic here the readmission um reduction the outlier calculation usually includes the charges from both admissions is that going to be consistent with medicare if Sorry, I, Skip, I don't think i'm could you restate your question one more time i wasn't quite following it sure uh so for the reduction in payments for re for readmission um over the 30 days uh, if you've got an outlier associated with that um, readmission service, I believe Medicare combines the the cost of the of the two admissions to calculate the outlier. If I may, Michelle, it's my understanding that main care doesn't tend to do that. Okay. Currently, for readmissions those separate events are then considered one event. And for the purposes of outlier calculations, it's considered one event, much in the same manner that Medicare applies. So you're right, as we extend the 30 day to 30 days, those new ones that would fall in, potentially some of those will fall into outlier payment status as well, as probably it's likely happening currently now. Thank you. Um, I also have, one question on the days waiting placement. I mean, that million dollar coverage, that is all inclusive of the PPS hospitals and the critical access hospitals that may have a day's the Critical waiting. access hospital um, policy is separate and remains as it is today. So that 1 million um, uh, would just apply to acute care. Thank you. Thank you. 
Linda? Uh, yes, this is Linda Dixon from York Hospital. Uh, my question is, for the provider-based clinic impact, have you performed a reimbursement impact by provider? And if so, could you share that with us uh, before the comment period? So, um, David uh, earlier talked through the general process for that fiscal impact. Um, I'd actually meant to state earlier that one of the challenges with our lack of alignment with Medicare right now is that um, we do have some concerns about the consistent understanding and application of main care's current policy and practice. Um, I, in part, uh, we don't have a system that does a great job of uh, tracking all the exemptions and uh, this policy for Medicare is confusing. Uh, I think it's also confusing where we do it differently. And so um, I, while we were looking at impact, we did have questions internally, to be honest, about, um, you, you know, are all policies uh, billing um, in alignment with current policy? And we we don't have a solid answer to to that question, which is which is one reason we one further reason that we think alignment uh, is the way to go because it uh, just simplifies understanding and and compliance and everything else. Um, so I, I wanted to note that because um, um, and this applies to this proposal overall. We do not have a regular practice of sharing a provider specific calculated impacts. Um, uh, everything is an estimate, and uh, so those numbers inevitably end up being wrong, whether they are, are low or high, so that is a challenge. Um, and in earlier high-level estimates that we shared as we went through today, uh, 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 things change, um, and especially prospectively utilization changes, et cetera, so we, we do not think that the benefits outweigh the costs of, of sharing that level uh, of detail from the state. Mark? Mark, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. This is Mark Souders with Maine General Medical Center. Um, earlier, you referenced on uh, the inpatient slide um, benchmarking the DRG relative weights to Medicare. And I wanted to make sure I understood that. Are you saying you will actually use the Medicare weights? Thank that you. That is correct. Taylor? Uh, yes, yeah, so with regard to uh, um, the attempt to align to Medicare, was there a conscious decision made as, as far as for rehab hospitals tying to the IPPS rather than to the ERF PPS? Taylor, are you from New England Rehab? Just uh, yes, with New England Rehab, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, David or Steve? Can you take that question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, we, we did uh, discuss aligning with Medicare on this and um, just uh, just the fact that the, the system's configuration is, is very different. Uh, it would require uh, length of stay adjusters, uh, for example, um, led us to uh, not recommend that change for, for just a single uh, facility, for just a single hospital, um, and instead uh, just align with the, the IPPS with the, with the much, uh, much higher base rate, um, recognizing that the length of stay is, is longer for uh, rehab stays. Thank you. Um, while um, we're waiting to see if anybody else has any questions, I just want to remind people that I've posted the email address to send your comments to in the chat. And at the beginning of the meeting, we did post the link to our rate reform website in the chat where people can look there for this um, 
recording and our PowerPoint presentation, which will be posted sooner than you'll receive the e-notice that will be sent out. Um, William? Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Yeah, William Ford from Northern Light Health. I, if this was mentioned, I uh, I missed it. But um, the cash flow impacts of these changes will be uh, greatly needed, and uh, for our, for our hospitals. And curious, when if there's a timetable? I know everything's retro, but I was curious when we could expect those rates or some sort of cash flow from these rate changes starting July 1st um, to help finance what I would expect to be is a higher tax bill coming in November and uh, May, or if there's alignment there. Uh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll take a uh, first stab at this and um, I'll just note that the November tax payment is not impacted by the tax changes uh, that, that have been passed in statute. Those tax changes uh, won't apply until the May 2025 payment. So uh, that, that increased tax obligation uh, won't come due until May of 25. Um, so we, we, we did want to uh, make sure that the, the rate increases uh, happened uh, at the start of the fiscal year and, and gave a little bit of uh, additional time for that cash flow to start coming through before the, the higher tax payment became due. That that's great news. Um, do we have a time frame or any sort of expectation of when the system could be updated for these rates and that cash will flow through the remittances? And should should we be aware or prepared for any sort of downtime if there's a major retro reprocessing of claims or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, as Michelle mentioned, we do need to wait for the budget to become effective before uh, moving forward with implementation. Uh, we are targeting early August for those implementations, and um, uh, so that would be uh, approximately a month, maybe a month and a, a couple weeks worth of claims that uh, could be adjusted retroactively. Uh, once that implementation was complete, um, we, we do need to work with our change management team and our uh, uh, MMIS vendor to uh, nail down the exact implementation timelines, but, but we are working towards uh, early August implementation. Okay, great. That helps. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We do have more time before 12.30. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I do have a question about um, claims processing. So will the main care system be able to accommodate the um, PO and PN modifiers required for provider-based um, off-campus clinics? Uh, yes, yep, we, will. We, we won't have to make any additional systems changes to accommodate those Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford. William, did you have another comment or is your hand just still raised? Yep, I forgot to lower my hand. Sorry about that. Taking it down now. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. Oh. Um, for the readmissions issue, you say you're going to move to a clinically, clinically aligned. Do you have any guidance, clinical guidance, on how you're going to be doing that that can be shared so we can comment on it? We can provide some more information about um, how we'll be looking at those claims. Okay. 
Kathy? Hi. I, I just wanted to know if there's going to be a change in the base year for the tax corresponding with the change in tax rate. What base year should we be expecting to estimate tax on for the change? Yeah, the, the um, tax rate change uh, that will be, that will apply to the May 2025 rate will be rebased to the uh, 2022 uh, hospital cost reports. Thank you. Oh. Michelle, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I, I feel like it's going to be picked up on just a little bit, which is, as, as Jeff pointed out, late in the game here, right? We all, I think, before had the opportunity to try to, as best as we could, calc do the calculations to understand the impact on impact on these types of changes so that so that we could appropriately evaluate them and make comment and in some cases people lobbied legislatively which i think is an opportunity that no one relishes but had before them previously and now i'm not sure that all that can happen now and so it, it is it is a bit of a challenge to know even how to comment today about what's being proposed and i'm not sure you know the t time frame we would need to look at that, and so that's certainly something we'll try to do. Um, and so I guess you know that's something we just have to look at internally. I think, and each of us have different abilities to do so with the school with the tools and skill sets that we each have. Is there is there anything that you'll be sharing um, at an organizational level at all? Or I, I don't recall that you did before either. So, you know, I'm not necessarily expecting that if it wasn't what was provided earlier, but. I, I will say in, in recognition of the timing, we, we will take back uh, the request Jeff mentioned too uh, around the comment period. There is an interaction between comment period and, and rulemaking. And I'm not sure if there's any leeway between um, Things that are retroactive versus perspective. So, uh, so we will look into that to to see yeah. if there's if there's room for movement there uh, to be responsive. Um, uh, but we do not anticipate uh, sharing provider level uh, estimated impacts at this time. Just on the on the uh, and I came on late, so I didn't even see the inpatient side. I apologize for that. But as it relates to that to the physician part um, and the six percent number. What I wasn't sure how to, first of all, that my first reaction was, well, that's not as much as I would have thought in terms of a percentage. But then I wasn't sure how you were answering the question about your own ability to analyze data relative to modifiers. And candidly, I don't know, sitting here right now, if we provide you with modifiers on Medicaid claims like we would on Medicare, I, I know we don't necessarily do that, I think, on commercial. So is that one of the limitations in the data that you described or Am I connecting the my connecting dots that shouldn't be connected? Uh, yeah, that is a, a data limitation because we do not currently require those PO modifiers. We we can't identify that uh, volume directly, um, which is yeah. why we had to go through those Medicare crossover claims. And you feel like that was a good substitute approach to do that, or? I mean, it's best you had, but do you think it, get, does it get you to a place where as if you had those modifiers up front, it would get you the same place? Or you don't really know. I mean, I, I don't know. So I'm just. I mean, I, I think that that would be a question we'd turn back to hospitals for yeah. some, it, you know, if you feel like for some reason the uh, use of the PO modifier and crossover claims would not be reflective of yeah. other claims more broadly. I, I can't think of a reason on the. Anyway, so th I think that's the question, yeah, right? Okay. Um, I, and I appreciate this up front, but so say it as I yield to Lou here, but I, I still appreciate all the work's going into this as it relates to increasing total payments, even though we have to hold our nose at some of this sometimes, it's still the collective result you're striving for is still beneficial and we appreciate that. Thank you, Al. 
Lou? Yeah, Michelle, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, just picking up on what else that um, obviously very appreciative for the, the movement um, uh, in payment. Um, as we go in and, and try to work on our um, uh, individual hospital impact, um, I think uh, if I, I've heard this right, the intent of the reduction um, around the provider base um, and the use of the, of the modifiers, I think you're targeting around a $10 million impact and you're pushing that back to the respective hospitals by virtue of the chain, the, I think is an increase on the outpatient side, the APC. So as we target our impact analysis, we should focus on that, correct, um, as we're doing that? And trying because the remain the the remainder is kind of staying the same. It's that that's really the some of that late breaking news. Um, is that correct? I just wanted to just clarify that. Yes. Yep. I, I if that's correct, I think that would be a, a good approach to identify um, your expected impact to your facility. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. William? Uh, yes. Um, so I guess as it relates to that, with that proxy of 10 million, I feel like that allowed you to raise the outpatient APC to the 109% from the 107 originally. If it were found to be more of a cost to the hospitals than that 10 million, would there be a review to go back to maybe up the 109% to maybe a 111? 11% if we found that it was double the impact of your proxy from the crossover review or something. It Just curious, because there's part of me that thinks, oh, maybe that's okay, but then other part of me wants to think that might cost us more than our relative share of the 10 mil that is being estimated. And I just want to know if that the intent would still be to feed that outpatient APC, the differential. Uh, certainly, we we welcome uh, uh, data and input um, as to it, you know that we had to make assumptions and and look at the best data we had available. Um, and so we welcome input on that data and those assumptions of fiscal impact um, and uh, our intent. If if we were like, oh yes, it looks like the impact is bigger than we anticipated, then we would reinvest that and, and change that percentage. With the caveat that we have to keep in mind, obviously the at UPL and that that should be neutral, but um, sometimes the there's a lot of moving parts in the big picture. So just wanted to state the utter importance of those UPL limits um, again as well. Nope, oh, that makes perfect sense. Before we go to the next question, I just wanted to state before people start to drop off that any comments that are being made on here, we please need you to submit them in writing to us for us to address them as part of the. Um, comment process for a response to. So this is a good discussion forum and for you to get a question answered right away and that you might not be submitting, but if it's a question that you want a written response to, please do submit that to one of the email addresses I provided in the chat. Next question. Lou, did you have another question or is your hand just still up? That's just me not operating properly. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. There's an update, so question. it just comes down automatically, you know. <laughs> well, I thought, but I guess not. <laughs> I'm trying to get this one to come. There we go. Sorry about that. So Michelle, if you want to wrap us up in the last two minutes, that'd be great. Sure, uh, we appreciate your comments and questions. Uh, they were all uh, well on point. And again, we really um, uh, appreciate the, the collaboration and collective work on this effort over, over many months. Um, so we will be back in touch and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all.